Let's pray. We're going to look at Luke 14 this morning, but while you're flipping there, let's, let's start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, you, man, you are so good to us. Um, cause the sun to shine, the leaves to change. Lord, the crispness of the, of the air this morning was just beautiful. And Jesus, we know that this world is fleeting and passing. It's, it's all meant to just go away eventually. But, but God, thank you for the beauty that you give us every day. It's a reminder to us of your faithfulness, your care, your attention to detail. And so, Jesus, as we were listening to prayer requests just a few minutes ago, God, I was staggered by the fact that you care so deeply to sometimes what seem to be insignificant pieces of our lives. Sometimes it's conversations that go on for years with people that we never see the end result of. I'm thinking of Craig's friends. Um, but yet, Jesus, you're at work. And so I thank you so much for those details. Jesus, this morning, I just pray that you and you alone would be the loudest voice in this room. Jesus, that your scripture would speak to us and that you would share what I've been <laughs> given the privilege of presenting this morning. God, these are your words um, for us collectively. And so I just appreciate you um, joining us and meeting us here again this morning. Father, we come as we are, that you might receive glory and praise. In your name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Well, again, this morning, it's good to be with you. My name's Phil. Um, I grew up over there and uh, live over there now uh, with some stuff in between, like Randy said. Um, but uh, this morning, we're going to be looking at a passage of the Bible that, frankly, I've probably read <laughs> hundreds of times, and yet uh, this morning was truly staggered as God revealed some stuff in my own heart that needed to be rooted out. And uh, so this morning, uh, buckle up, friends, because I think this one's a really good one for all of us collectively. Um, so Luke 14, 1 through 14 is what we'll be reading. Go ahead and swipe, or if you're old school and have an actual Bible with you, uh, it's on page 1145-ish, maybe. Yes, thank you. All the jokes. Luke 14. One Sabbath, when he, that is Jesus, dined at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. Behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy, and Jesus responded to the lawyers and the Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? They remained silent. Then he took him, and he healed him, and he sent him away. And, they said, and he said to them, Which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. So he told them a parable. Who, to those who were invited, and when he noticed how they chose their places of honor, he said to them, when you're invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by, the, by him, that is, the person throwing the feast, and he who invited you both come to you and say to you, give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you're invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who are at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and those he who humbles himself will be exalted. Verse 12. He also said to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers, or your relatives, or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed, because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. So this week, I had the uh, extreme pleasure, some might call it, 
um, others might not call it that, myself included, of attending a banquet in Pittsburgh. I put on a suit. Yes, I do own one, for those of you who would think otherwise. And I went to the Legislators Ball in Gawa in Pittsburgh at one of the biggest oil and gas headquarters in that area. Everybody was in their fanciest dress, all these 90-some lawmakers and a bunch of oil and gas executives and a bunch of people like me who had no business being there. And we walked around and, and we chatted and, and we drove in our fancy cars. Well, they have fancy cars. I have my truck. Um, and we talked about nothing for a good little while. And then it rained and we all went home. It was an out-of-place kind of banquet for me. And it reminded me, as I studied this very interesting little piece of text here, how out of place Jesus finds himself in our Jesus is invited by a Pharisee, actually one of the head Pharisees, to a basically a dinner after the past, or after the Sabbath uh, teaching and other things that had happened in the temple. It's a group of Pharisees that are the in crowd. It's the people who are at the top of this structure. And Jesus is invited. Now, Jesus, he's not totally out of place there. He was a teacher. He was respected. He was kind of familiar with that stuff. But he certainly was there for a reason. Not of honor, necessarily. In fact, uh, if you've ever heard the term reading the room, you might sense that this passage is dripping with one word. Any guesses? Yeah, it's hostility. This is a super hostile environment. Look again at the first couple of verses here of chapter 14. When he went to dine at the house of the ruler of the Pharisees, they were what? Watching him. Not just watching him, they were watching him carefully, the scripture says. Jesus is in a very out of place kind of place. They were waiting to bust him, as my teenagers might say, to pounce on any misstep, any misstep like a prowling lion waiting for someone to devour. Oh, that sort of sounds familiar. Um, kind of like the description of the enemy uh, in several verses. Jesus walks into a very interesting place. And then he does something very interesting. Jesus walks into a hostile environment, a place where he's not necessarily a friend, but he's a curiosity, and in some ways, even like the woman who was caught in the act of adultery, someone waiting to be ensnared. There's another interesting character in this uh, scene as, as Luke sets it up here. Um, again, this is the highest, the elitist, the best of the best. It's, it's not only the lead Pharisee, but look who else he references. There's all the lawmakers and the other religious leaders are there. And then one other guy, apparently. A man who is... We know nothing else about other than the fact that he is afflicted with this thing called dropsy. Who knows what dropsy is? Craig? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a, it's a physical ailment. It's not necessarily contagious. It's not necessarily a major problem, but it's this thing that's usually disfiguring. It's also very often um, works in the, in the body in a way that creates heavy fluid retention. So your body just keeps water. 
And it's very interesting that this guy is here because in the scriptures on the Sabbath day, and we're going to get into a lot more of this in a second here, but uh, as I was studying this morning, especially this really came kind of to the fore, to have somebody with something like that at a religious feast like this would have been very out of place. The man with dropsy would have been ceremonially and religiously unclean. He had no reason to be there. And in fact, you could probably make a pretty good case that there's one and only one reason that he was invited. Any guesses? (laughs) So Jesus could use him. Yeah. Maybe something along the lines of what the enemy meant for evil. God could do something good. Dropsy is a condition that, that retains fluid in the body. You might call it like an edema today, generally uh, around the heart uh, or major organs would, would carry uh, extra water. And by engaging this man, Jesus exposes a standard that's been put in place by years of tradition and law under the motif of the inbreaking of God's rule. Jesus comes on the scene. It's a Sabbath day, a day reserved for rest and for worship for the Jews. No work could be done, and so Jesus asks them a question. He says, is it lawful? According to your understanding of the scriptures and tradition of all these things, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? What's their reply? (laughs) This is nothing. You're sitting at a table with a bunch of lawmakers and Pharisees, the elite of the elite. He says, hey guys, question. Um, Jesus is over here, in case you're not familiar. Uh, Not that any eye was turned away from him. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? They remain silent. So in a hostile environment, the script on him and says, Here's a little bit of hostility for you. Is it lawful to do this? With nothing out of a response from them, Jesus disrupts the room by introducing a kingdom ethic of grace. I want us to remember those words this morning, kingdom ethic of grace, because I think we're about to go on a journey together that may actually be a little bit painful for us this morning. I won't say that too loud because we're not there yet, but keep in mind the kingdom ethic of grace this morning. So what does Jesus do? Whichever verse this is, I'm trying to find it. Um, Verse 4, they they remain silent. So Jesus took him and he healed him and he sent him away. Jesus took him and he healed him and he sent him away. In the Greek, those words, send him away, are less saying, here you go, go on your merry way, and saying Jesus released him. The Greek word is actually released. Jesus took him, and he healed him, and he released him. Let that wash over you for a second, because he says to the crowd then that's watching, Which of you, having a son or an ox that's fallen into the well on the Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? And verse 6, they couldn't reply to these things. What's Jesus doing? I used to teach for high school, so I need interaction. What's Jesus doing? Okay. Okay. Personalizing it? What else? Challenging? Yeah. He's pushing them to think, isn't he? He's also doing one thing, and the reason that they don't respond to the second question is because they can't. He is taking away their snares and their traps, and establishing his own authority to be able to teach them. 
we got to remember who these guys were. They were the best in their minds, right? According to their law, according to their ceremony, according to all the things that they had been raised and grown up in and done everything with their lives to try and be the best that they could, they had arrived. And now we have Jesus coming in and saying, which of you would not do these things on the Sabbath? And what he's doing is he's interpreting all of that law, all of that tradition, and making a correct assessment of it, isn't he? He's saying, even though you are not allowed to work, this day is reserved for worship, it's reserved for rest, it is still okay for you to act as a father and as a responsible owner of these things. But it's interesting that he, in this example, puts those things in a well. Because remember what he said to the guy with dropsy that he healed? I release you. And now in this example, I rescue you. Not only can I release, Jesus says, which he just did, but he makes the point that it's okay to rescue as well. Now, one thing that I want to make sure that we point out, because this is super important and we're going we're gonna to end on this note, but I want to put it in here just to be sure that we understand it. We need to remember one thing about what Jesus does and where he gets his authority and actions from. Who knows off the top of their head? Where does Jesus claim to receive the insight for what he's doing? From the Father. Jesus over and over again in Scripture says, I only do what I see my Father doing. I release you. I rescue you. Jesus is saying very clearly, this is what I see the Father doing. And they are left with no reply. Jesus' main contention with the Pharisees about their Sabbath mandates and practices is that they were taking something that should be celebrated rest and worship, and they were piling on. They were adding burden to burden. In fact, they had numbered the number of steps that you could take from your house on the Sabbath, lest you err and fall into work. At my house, that would be four. If I take more than four steps, my children are dying. And that is the end of it. Right? Yeah. I love him. He needs to be here every Sunday. (laughs) They were adding burden to what was supposed to be joy. What was supposed to be worship. In fact, in the Jewish tradition, the Sabbath was so sacred that it was to be wholly oriented toward God. It was the only day that the Jews named with a name. Did you know that? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, all that stuff. And not, not in ancient Judaism. It was the Sabbath. And it was the day after the Sabbath, or the day leading up to the Sabbath, or two days after the Sabbath, and two days leading up to the Sabbath, and then that day in the middle. They oriented their lives as Jews around this idea that they were to commune with the living God and that to be their orientation. The religious leaders, the scholars, the lawmakers had piled on. And Jesus says, you're missing the point. The point is not the rules. The point is not the the things by which you get here. The point is God. The point is communion with the living God, Yahweh. Jesus is most concerned with reorienting life back toward a relationship with the Father. And even for the Pharisees themselves. Joel Green in his commentary on Luke says this, In the opening scene, with a focus on the redemptive necessity of healing on the Sabbath, Jesus sees the problem and he says, let's release this guy. Of a bloated man whose craving for water 
is as self-destructive as it is unquenchable. It subverts Pharisaic norms and religious purity and legal observance, and at the same time that it metaphorically and ironically opens up the possibility for the Pharisees to be healed of a hypocrisy manifest in ravenous greed. A lot of big words. I apologize, sort of. Don't miss this visu- the visual brilliance of this. One of the things the Pharisees were most guilty of was taking more and more of God's word in, being continuously, ravenously desiring to be better at their religion without being filled to pour back out. Don't miss the beauty of this picture. Jesus wants to fill us to pour back out. He releases the burden. In fact, uh, I won't go into all the details, but uh, often this whole um, dropsy thing was used as a picture for the Pharisees because they were bloated but ever wanting more. There was a saying in antiquity that said, there is no thirst greater than dropsy because while always drinking, you're always dry. And I think that is such a good picture of how, be a little careful, I might get uh, something thrown at me and I'll be all right with that if you decide to. I've got a big podium up here I can hide behind. Sometimes the church is like this. We want so much more Jesus, but not because we want to put it back out in the world and love people. Because we want to look good in our own eyes. We want to get our Instagram-ready life ready. We we live in a culture that is so self-indulgent that often we lose sight of everybody else around us. I'll prove it to you because it's the second half of what we're talking about here this morning. Sorry, this is going to be a little bit longer than normal. I don't apologize any more than that. Jesus was saying something to me this morning, and I think we need to do it. These are this next section. It's labeled parables, but really Jesus is giving kind of immediate commentary. Um, sort of the Instagram life hacks of the first century Judaism. He now turns his attention, with them not being able to reply to him, directly to those sitting at the table. They're there for a meal, yes, but these meals in antiquity served a very vital social function. Luke, a physician, classically trained, writes from the perspective of the Greco-Roman background, and the practice of gathering over a meal or even just drinks was referred to as symposia or symposium. It's a gathering designed as a way for social interaction where ideas could be shared openly and freely by all classes, ethnicities, socioeconomic citizens, and the Jews kind of use this idea to be best exemplified on the teaching that happened at the temple steps. They would come together and they would have discussions. They would have free exchange of ideas, and people could argue about finer points of theology. But in this scene, Luke paints what was normally a collaborative gathering in a light of confirmation bias at its most finest picture. Talking in a circle to those who think exactly like we do constantly is a dangerous thing. I've recently started reading a lot more um, Catholic, a lot more uh, other other Christian faith perspectives on things. And for me personally, it's been very, very helpful to break my train of thought that I'm used to thinking in. That's an aside. The Pharisees saw these group gatherings as a chance to establish the in-group boundaries that embodied the socio-religious values pertaining 
to ceremonial purity to worship at its finest. Again, this was a gathering of a, the social elite. You didn't get an invite to this unless you were, quote unquote, worthy. For Jesus, the table is a place of sharing, celebrating, inviting, and even suspending boundaries, as often Jesus was associated with the wrong people. Sinners. This is why this is such a brilliant passage of Scripture. Because Luke, once again, comes crashing through with Jesus' very own words that this is good news for the poor. He sees this perversion, and he calls for humility and recentering of our focus. And so, humility is kind of a theme that I want to spend the last couple of seconds here on. By seconds, I'm lying. It's going to be minutes. Humility is so much more than what we often think about it as. If you say there's a, if you know somebody who is a humble person, what are some adjectives that you would describe them as? Humble. What does it mean? I heard selfless, maybe, and thoughtful of others. Is that it? Okay. What else? Kindness. Okay. Humility. Kindness. Yep. Yeah. Not putting yourself first. Serve? Is that what you said? Yeah, servant. I think I agree with all those things. Often in my own mind, there's something else associated with it. And it's negative thinking about yourself. Oh, that person's so humble. Because they're constantly kind of self-deprecating, right? Oh, I'm not that good. I'm not that good looking. I'm not that good at that job or that thing. Oh, that person's better than me. But humility is not that. And this is the word that I think God has for us this morning. I want to read a little bit out of this book. Uh, this is uh, one of my favorite authors. His name is Brendan Manning. Not sure if anybody's familiar with him. Um, this is his book called Ruthless Trust. And while I was reading this morning, well, as I was reading this week, I came upon this chapter. And I'd like to read a little excerpt of it because... Um, I think it hits this right on the head so well. He says this, Poor self-image reveals not humility, but instead a lack of humility. Feelings of insecurity, inadequacy, inferiority, self-hatred, rivet our attention on ourselves. Humble men and women do not have a low opinion of themselves. They have no opinion of themselves, because they so rarely think about themselves. The heart of humility lies in undivided attention to God, a fascination with his beauty revealed in creation, a contemplative presence to each person who speaks to us, a deselfing of our plans, projects, ambitions, and soul. Humility is manifested in an indifference to our intellectual, emotional, and physical well-being, and a carefree disregard of the image we present, no longer appeared with, no longer concerned with appearing to be good. Hello, church. No longer concerned with appearing to be good, we can move freely into the mystery of who we really are, aware of the sovereignty of God and our own absolute inefficiency, and yet moved by the spirit of radical self-acceptance without self-concern. Humble people are without pretense, free from any sense of spiritual superiority, liberated from the need to be associated with people of importance. The awareness of their spiritual emptiness does not disconcert them at all, neither overly sensitive to criticism nor inflated by praise. They recognize their brokenness, acknowledge their gifts, and refuse to take themselves seriously. I think we could all use a little bit of a dose of that. A truly humble man does not fear being exposed 
when the light of Christ dawned in our darkness, we sink to our knees and we pray with the sinful but honest tax collector at the temple, oh God, have mercy on us, sinners. One more little excerpt. The great weakness of the North American church at large is certainly in my life is our refusal to accept our brokenness. We hide it, evade it, gloss over it. We grab for the cosmetic kit and put on our virtuous face to make ourselves admirable in public. Thus, we present to others a self that is spiritually together, superficially happy, and lacquered with a sense of self-deprecating humor that passes for humility. But the irony is that while we do not want anyone to know, we are yet judgmental, lazy, vulnerable, screwed up and afraid for fear of losing face. The face that I fear losing is a mask of an imposter, not actually my own. Last thing from Brennan. There's one conspicuous absence of power and wisdom in the North American church. It has arisen because we have not come to terms with the tragic flaw in our lives. The brokenness that is proper to the human condition. Because as Paul quotes, my power works best in your weakness. Last week, Randy mentioned that, I can't remember if it was after worship or what, the beautiful chaos of our community. And friends, we are broken people. And guess what? That's okay. In fact, that's good. Because it should lead us to be able to go to the table unburdened by what we can possibly bring. Our thoughts, our ambitions, our notions of self-worth mean nothing. Each time we take communion, each time we fellowship together, each time we worship in this place, it is because we can't offer God anything. But he's offered us everything. Please hear us this morning. And I say us because it's not me. I'm pretty sure this is what the Holy Spirit wants to teach our community. Our faces turned toward Jesus is the only thing that matters. This building is beautiful. I am so thankful to be in this place. I'm so, so thankful for the hard work that's gone into it. But Jesus wants our hearts, not our work. I'm going to ask Noah to come up and just play on the guitar for a couple of minutes here. I'm going to close this in prayer. We're done. I'd ask you before the rest of the worship team joins him just to take a minute. Close your eyes. Take a walk if you need to. It's a beautiful day outside. Can we maybe take stock this morning and ask where we sit at the table with Jesus. He's called us into this glorious, unburdened, free life. And all we have to do is show up. So this morning, I'd ask you, just, just take you know a minute. Uh, close your eyes. Again, go for a walk. Grab a cup of coffee. You know, I'll even ask if anybody wants to, I'll go to that corner. Or maybe Randy can go to that corner. If anybody wants to pray with someone this morning, we can pray together. If there's more than Randy and I can handle, deacons, elders, any one of you, <laughs> stand up and go back there and meet some people. And let's pray together. You can sit silent. You can sing. There's no pressure. There's no anything else. But this morning, I'd invite you to face toward Jesus. Be healed of the gluttony of self-worth and be released into the beauty of what God has for us. Let's pray. Jesus, you and you alone are worthy of our praise, of our admonition, God, of our very lives. 
Lord, I'm as guilty as anyone else of focusing on the things that just don't matter. Putting on the good face, turning up the music so that I can't hear your voice, God, walking away from uncomfortable situations because you might be calling us to something incredible, but we're scared. And so, Jesus, this morning, as we worship you, would you make your face bright upon us? Lord, would you bring us back into a place where we find you enthralling? God, for those who don't know you or haven't walked very long with you, would you awaken a light in them that cannot be quenched? And for those of us that have walked with you for a while, would you reawaken us to something new? Jesus, I don't know what exactly you have for this community, but we collectively say yes and amen, God. Bring it on. And to the best of our ability, we'll stumble along for the ride. Jesus, only you are worthy of our best efforts. So we'll give you this day, we'll give you this place, we'll give you our lives for whatever you'll have. In your name, Jesus.